Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Today, I'm super excited to have York Michaels. York is CEO and co-founder of Basketball and a Basketball Skills Development Specialist from Belgium, and he runs Elite Athletes. And uh, first off, York, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Let's start first by talking, York, about uh, Elite Athletes and what it is and what are some of the goals of this. Yeah. Um, so we elite athletes, we get kind of like uh, two things. So we get the elite academy. It's kind of like um, we want to build uh, kind of like a club, but it, it's more than just basketball. So we we try to um, get our philosophy of how we should work with youth players um, into. We made it a program, but it's it's much bigger than just uh, basketball. It's like we. We get the complete school follow-up system. Uh, players get classroom sessions about stuff like meditation, how to handle social media, um, much more. Much more things like we want to literally get them ready for the next phase in their life. So that's kind of like the latest project we have. And then we, at least, we have a, a training facility where we get a half basketball court and then a room for some strength and conditioning. And uh, in, in the facilities, more like for uh, we, we train one on one with the pro players, and then in the evening, the gym is open for everyone who just likes our approach and wants to work out with us. And, so and we're going to connect yeah. some of those ideas about integration of movement and uh, some of the different philosophies that you guys use, which I think are very valuable for people to understand. But uh, let's talk about the beginning of this because my understanding is that you built slowly with this and that you actually started, was it with an under 15 group that you kind of built with and experimented with? Yeah, so it started actually uh, eight years ago. So uh, everybody was always talking about uh, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. So that was kind of like the quote, uh, the most popular quote that day. And we said like, all right, let's do an experiment. We want, to, we want to see if we can get kids from 10 years old and we can develop them over eight years, over eight year period. In our philosophy, can we get kids from the lowest level to the highest level? So we just went to a club and said like, this is the experiment that we get. We get one skills trainer, we get one head coach, and we get one strength uh, and conditioning coach. Um, and we went to the team that has a the kids played on the lowest level. So you got eight levels in Belgium and these kids were really on the, yeah, the eight level. So we're all great kids, no talent, but great motivated kids. So we, we went to the parents and we said, we want to do an experiment and see like, what can we bring from this group? And uh, the parents said, okay, let's go for it. So, but we were still very young. We were like 20 years old, no experience at all with coaching. But we had our philosophy and we just started experimenting with the kids and working more on the fundamentals. For, for example, for the first uh, four years, we did nothing five on five. The, we only did uh, one on one, three on three, mini side games, stuff like that. And every practice was like fundamentals was, I think, 80% of the game. And then 20% we worked on uh basic decision making stuff with the uh, team tactics and then uh after practice we did 15 minutes of of uh core work and stability and stuff like that and the first uh, three years we got our we got our ass kicked like the team was was nowhere we were we were beaten on on every level and uh after three years actually we got kicked out of the club because the club has something like they they had a new uh a new owner and he was like what are these guys doing they're they're not following the the same program as all the other uh teams do so they said like yeah there's no room for you guys so we we started something on our own and all the kids they said like and the parents they wanted to stay with us so we we kept working with them and then after the fourth year we started to add the five on five so we had a a new head coach coming in and his job was to only learn them the basketball like you in in five on five and the first year it was we didn't even made it to the top 24 and then one year later everything changed so we were the top scoring team in the country i think we were averaging like 107 points a game 
And then the second best defensive team. I think we had 52 points a game uh, against us. And we we lost the last game of the season. So we in the final four. So otherwise we would be the the champs. But we, we finished the final four as the second best team. And suddenly like all eyes were on on us on the program because everyone was oh no it's the same kids what hap- what, what what is happening what are they doing and that's great how and old were those kids at that time were they, they, they um that that time they were uh 15 so okay. it, it was, was year five to 15. Okay. after five years they they started to uh yeah the you you, you start seeing the results from the the process well, and what I love we about sorry, the best scoring team in the country were averaging 135. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. awesome. It's tremendous. And what what me? I love about yeah. this and and why this is so important for coaches to understand is obviously the long term development focus versus, in your words, short term goals of winning games. Like, yeah, this, indeed, this is 100 percent what we're talking about if we're talking about you know, high school basketball in the, unit in the U.S., we're talking about AAU programs, we're talking about development with a long-term play. Uh, and yeah, you're going to lose games at the beginning, but with the focus on development, players will get better. And I assume the other part of this is that you retained a lot of your players within the program. Yeah. They didn't drop Indeed. out. Mm-hmm. True. So I can think you like, talk about that? Yeah, because it's, like for us, winning games has never been a goal. It's an it's an outcome. And for example, also the thing where I'm very proud of is we, from every player in our team, they all play pretty much the same minutes. So we had literally every player of the team has already made over 20 points this season. So one game he starts, next game he starts. So it's, I think it's it's the proof that you can, if you get kids who are willing to work hard and you give them the right stuff to work on, that you can get results with, with every player. And it's also about, I think the, the biggest thing that we that separates us with the other teams, I think, is also the the mindset. We're huge on teaching the, the mindset with the kids. The kids, they come, they come early. I'll tell you a story about that. Like, our rule is, uh, the first rule is don't be on time, be early. So if you're not 15 minutes early before practice, you are late. That's the, the first rule. And the second rule is practice starts when the first player arrives. So the first player comes in, for example, like an hour before practice. Then we start doing one-on-one on the court. Then the next player jumps in. And that's how we can create more, uh, more length in our practices. So actually, like two two seasons ago, this was getting out of hand. So <laughs> we had uh, w- we were renting a gym from a school, and uh, the principal of the the school he he walked in like ninety minutes before practice, and there were already eight guys on the court. And we're already <laughs> like doing form shooting, and and he was like, "Oh, what is this? This is not this is not okay. You're not renting the gym already." So we had like a warning, but we just keep I, I instead of like keeping the kids on the street, we just said like come to the gym and get some extra working. So the next time he came in, again, six or seven guys were already working out an hour before practice actually started. And so we got even kicked out of the school for that. <laughs> but, it's, but for me, it's, it's, it's cool. You see the mindset, if you can get kids to, uh, we, we call it the Kaizen mindset. So you do every, every day you want to do something to, to get better at. It can be small things like watch film or, uh, watch tape of your best player or or do a workout at home or anything you want, but every day you got to do something to get better. And all our players, they believe in that. And that's I think that's the biggest difference is, uh, between us and the other teams is the mindset is completely, completely different. Well, can you take, talk about some of the things? I mean, uh, the Kaizen mindset, love that. Uh, love the mentality that you built and the mindset that you built, but what what led to that mindset in the players? Like what connected for them that made them self-motivated? Because ultimately that's that's the best thing that we could do as a coach is make it player-led that they're self-motivated. We're not the motivator. They're the motivator. They're there. And we're there as yeah. someone who's aiding their development, not pushing their development. Yeah. I think, I think it's because... The, the Kaizen mindset is was always the, the the startup of the elite athletes. We had the same mindset, and we I think we lead by example with our coaching staff. 
And I think that's the, the biggest reason that players just, they, they just want to follow with us. They, they, they take over our habits and they, they make it their own. So, and we, we strongly want our players to dream, to dream big. And we, everything is possible if you, if you work hard. And the, the, yeah, the, we want to focus on the things that you can control. And the things you can control is always like how much effort you want to put into this. So I think it's, if you get a, a couple of guys of the team who were on the same page, it's, then it's, it's easier for the rest to, to follow. Well, and the great part too for your philosophy is that uh, you were patient. You were all yep. understanding, and I assume this was a sell to the parents and to the players that we're going to build slowly, and in the long run, we're going to be better because of it, rather than focusing on the short-term gains. And can yep. you talk a little bit? Like, was that actually you sitting down with parents and explaining it, pl- explaining it to players, or was it just something that was understood? No, actually, it's. Uh... It's one of the struggle points we have right now. So we, we started with our academy, a new team. So we get an under-16 team, team uh, for the first year uh, now. And the thing is, like, uh, in Belgium, you, you need to finish first or second in the first uh, round to make it to the top 24 teams. And we're not going to make it. And some of the parents right now are like, oh, no, we're not going to make it to the top 24. Like, people are laughing with us. Um, they're making jokes. Uh, the system is not good. Uh, but it's, it's like I, I had a conversation with them yesterday. It's like we're not, our goal is not to win games. Our goal is to build players in the long run. And if you want to, we can develop them to have real quick results, but it's not going to help them in the long run. It's, it's a process. And right now we're not good enough yet but to make it to the top 24. So you can't expect them to, to do that already. It's, the results will come if you put in the work and if you, we call it trust the process, like you need to have faith in it and it's, it's step by step, but it's, it's long term. And that's the problem. I think with most coaches, they, they're only focused on, on next weekend because they want to win. They want to win as much games as possible. But our goal is to get guys in the NBA. That's we, we don't have Belgium guys in the NBA and that's, that's the thing where we aim, aim for and it's not going to work if you have short-term goals. Well, that's tremendous. And, and just to note for people that, uh, you know, you work with pro athletes and you've had a tremendous number of pro athletes come through your facility as well. And this isn't just youth development, that this philosophy of, of, of Kaizen and focusing on the individual yeah. that applies to all levels. Hear me? That you work with. Yes. Oh, did we lose you? Do, do, do. All right, you hear me back? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. now I hear you back. Yeah, okay. it was, uh, it was no. off. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. I'll start again. Uh, so, all right. Of note for people is that, uh, you know, you guys work with pro, at, pro players as well. This isn't just youth development, and that this Kaizen and this philosophy on the individual focus and on their overall holistic development, that applies to pro players, not just youth players as well. Can you talk a little bit about the pro athlete component of this, too? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that I learned in eight years with uh, working with with uh, pro players is the secret is in the basics. And I think pro players still come for me um, to become better at the basics. So that's the thing like we want to put, for example, in the academies. We Our goal is to get them, we call it basic amazing. You need to become amazing at the basics and that's going to help you in the long run. It's... And, and that's the thing I think with the pros is what they're missing in their, um, in their own teams is everything is focused on uh, five on five and, uh, and getting ready for next game. But you need to, you can never work enough on the fundamentals. It should be also, even if you're a pro player, it should still be in your routine that you work weekly on, on just the basics of the game. It's, I think that's the biggest reason why, why players still come for me is because there is no skill development in, in, in professional basketball. Well, I love that term, basic, uh, uh, basically basic amazing. amazing. Love that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. And so you, you did mention previously too that, you know, say for that early group, 80% of practice was fundamentals. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know also, you know, you're a believer in block versus random practice and understanding those different components of that in terms of skill acquisition and motor learning. So can you frame for us a little bit of our understanding of what you mean by basic, amazing and fundamentals? Are we talking on air? Are we talking one on O? Are we talking, you know, random practice? What are we talking about? When we're talking about basic. Amazing? Yeah. It's funny because um, I've been doing a lot of research about block practice versus random practice. Uh, it started with, uh, with the NBA uh, guy, uh, Alex Arama. So he, He's huge on the, on the random practice and we had multiple discussions about it. So I started experimenting with it and reading some more from, for example, like Brian McCormick, his uh, books and stuff like that. And I think practice should be a mix. That's what, what I feel is, for example, I think uh, I'm a big fan of Drew Hanlon, uh, NBA skills trainer. Uh, I've been following his work for years, but he's all about block practice and then you have the opposite is i think is, is brian mccormick is is all about random practice and random games but i think it should be a mix what i see is uh, right now with uh, decision making drills for teaching new skills is the decision making is in my opinion um how should i say it it's sometimes it's quantity above quality so what I think is block practice can get you really good in the details of teaching moves and it can get you really good in as coaching also in, in focusing on the smaller parts of the movements. But I think the next step after block practice where you do moves one on zero should be the adding the decision making. Because what I see is we have, I've seen tons of kids who have the craziest fundamentals but they cannot do it in a game because they, they don't have the basketball IQ to, to read the defender or to, to make the, the right decisions. So I think decision-making is definitely an important part, but in my opinion, it should be 50-50. That's how I teach it. For example, if you have... Um, my practice is I always work on one topic, one head topic, and then in my, I have three things that I work every day on. So it's ball handling, Every day I do three to five minutes ball handling, not longer than that. After that, I do finishing for 20 minutes, and then I do form shooting for 20 minutes. So my warm-up is 45 minutes uh, every day, and it's always those three things because I think those are the three most important things in basketball. I want my players to uh, handle the ball, even if they're the big guy or point guard. It doesn't matter. Everybody should be really comfortable handling the ball. I want my players to be able to finish in every situation in the paint with every hand um, uh, perfectly. And the third part is shooting is for me the most important skill in basketball. So I want every player to become a, a great shooter. So those three things are my warm up for 45 minutes. And then I work on one topic. And if I work, for example, the topic can be, let's say, uh, creating on the catch, then it would be 30 minutes rather block practice where I really try to focus on the details. And then 30 minutes there, we work on decision-making small-sided games where we add the, where we create a situation where they need to use the moves that they just learned. So that's kind of like my philosophy for practice. No, that's great. I mean, that's, it's, it's definitely what I believe in, in terms of a drill. A drill must have a connection ultimately to the game. And that's what you're talking about is that, uh, you know, and I love that obviously you take that part at the end of practice and, and, put it in the context of the game for the athlete so they know why they're working on it. But uh, that, that gives us a great picture of kind of what your workout is and how it flows. And that's really good because I was told to ask about your pre-practice routine. And, and that's what mm -hmm. you're talking about, the ball handling, the finish, and the form work, form shooting, right? Yeah. What age do you, yeah. do you start people at shooting, you know, in terms of that? Uh, like, is Belgium modify what? for the ages or how does that work for you? You mean, you mean for form shooting? For or any type mean, of like, shooting, yeah, like prepubescent, do you start, do you, do you focus on form shooting or is that something as a, because really the whole, whole basics of what you're saying is that, and I 100% agree, basketball mm -hmm. is ultimately a late development sport. We can mm -hmm. develop some ball mastery and different things at a really young age, but how good they're going to get is in those later years after 
puberty or whenever it may be. So can you, can you talk about a little bit about when you start shooting with, uh, with young athletes? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm only working with kids over 12. Okay. So, uh, um, but for me, it's, it starts w- with my guys under 14. I rather focus on uh, more on the finishing and the ball handling because I think those are the and the basic footwork. I think those are the three things that I, I focus the most on. And with my under 16 team, it starts with the uh, with the form shooting. That's the uh, the big the biggest uh, part in the in the warm I mean, in the in, as a focus. Um, but I think with under 14, I would still focus more on, on finishing. And getting that touch, right hand, left hand, stuff like that, different situations, different kind of footwork, and and just making sure the, the handles are, are tight. But I think from an, an age of under 16, you should start to focus on uh, on getting the form. Well, and I love that because it, it fits into your philosophy in general, which is building slowly, is that, again, mm-hmm. we can't teach it all at once. Like it's too often we try and teach everything at once in one practice. And even the concept of you saying you have one topic after that, that routine is, is tremendous. And uh, you know, I love that mindset for player development. How often would you work with an athlete? Would it be daily? Is it weekly? What is it in terms of your program? If I can choose? Yeah, yeah daily for sure. Like as much as possible. So we got a new concept with our, with our academy guys. Is we call it uh, 24-7. So it means like I give every player a, a golden key of the gym and I want my, we call it like a, also the, the Mamba mentality. I want my players to, they can, they can send me a message any day of the, any time of the day. So if they say like, I want to work out before school at six, I'm there at six. If they say like in the weekend, can we get a workout at the, in a, even in the night or something? I don't care. I will be there. But every player has a, a key because I want them to come as, as much as as possible so i think yeah you can never work enough on your on your game there's always something that you can can do it doesn't even have to be on the court but off the court again guys in mindset try to do something uh, to get better every day well it's tremendous and and this is a great segue into what what we're going to frame for people because i don't want them to get that impression that's only basketball in your program as you mentioned already because really the the unique part and what really attracted to me what you guys do is that there's a, a there's a lot of synergy with what you do and then approaching it from a multi-sport perspective is that yeah. it's not just basketball you're focusing on movement you're focusing on 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 different things that connect the basketball player to their body and understanding of their body can you talk about that yeah and also, it's not, it's not only even that. We, I, I never believed in the system of having one coach for, for like one team because we expect the coach to be good at everything. Like, and the kids are going to become good in what's the expertise of the coach. So what we do with our academy is, for example, we have eight coaches and every coach only needs to do what he's the best at. So we got a defensive coach and we get a, one guy who's only teaching a two-man game. We got one guy who's only teaching shooting. We got a movement coach and a skills trainer, uh, strength and conditioning coach, physio, and then the head coach was really good at the tactics. But I strongly believe in the system of we need coaches to specialize instead of like doing everything. It's much better if you can make a, a small team of coaches and everybody can just focus on, on their, their best uh, uh, topic. Well, that's great. So that's, and can you talk a little bit about what Olivier Goodluck does with uh, some of the movement training and, and how that connects to the basketball? Yeah, so he just it's, he works a lot with the fighting monkey. So it's kind of it's athletic development. Um, so he, he thinks more outside the box. So he sees like, what if our players would be really good in, uh, for example, like dancing or... Uh, or coordination or things like that. So it's, he's stepping away from the traditional programs and creating more like uh, the ultimate athlete instead of like focusing only on our uh, basketball players just needs this and this and this. He wants to make them, make the, the, the kids also more creative. Like it's, he's, he's a lot about more, uh, yeah, it's, how much I say it? It's, the connection between brain and, and how the body works more 
building chaos, chaos situations where movements, there is not just one solution. There are multiple ways how to move with it. So he's trying to make our players more creative by giving them different kind of challenges in multiple sports. Well, that's tremendous. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we all have to keep in mind. I mean, for, for the young athletes and so many of the studies obviously paint the picture that a multi-sport athlete just has less injury, a, a better overall experience and, and better development. And, uh, you know, all those things that you guys do paint that picture as well. So that's wonderful. Uh, can we get into a little bit as well? Some of the, some of the mindset of uh, the positionless basketball. Like you're not focused on positions at all. And that's part of the beauty of your system is that it is truly building a player to be the best version of themselves, regardless of what position they ultimately get put into. Yeah. I think the basketball is like slowly changing into in the long run, maybe even positionless basketball. So I think if you want to teach the basketball of the future, then it's it starts already right now so with our players we don't want to put them into boxes like you're a point guard you're a shooting guard you're a you're a big man no we want our players to do to be able to do everything that's why we don't make differences between uh, definitely not at the young age between what we teach them so our big man they, he they also needs to do like the the pick and roll reads he also needs to do like the ball handling finishing i want them to have the players have the full package and it shows also with the games, it's much easier. Like if every, the, every player who gets a rebound can immediately be the point guard. It's, it makes the system just so much uh, easier to play basketball. And I think that's also like how basketball will be played in the, in the future. Like players, you're going to have seven footers who, who are going to be point guards. I think that's, yeah, you, you need to be ready for the future and, Basketball is getting more and more creative, and we want to. You want to create. Uh, yeah, cre you wanted to have uh, creative players. That's which, that's our goal. Which is great, and I'll follow up on that too. And uh, well, maybe let's ask it now. So, so what are some things that develop creativity in players? Because when when I watch some of your videos and some of the different things like that, I get that impression that your players have some freedom to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And, I, and yeah. I love that as well. So what are some of the things that you do to foster creativity within an athlete? Yeah. Um, first of all, I want my players to fail in practice. So I would strongly recommend failing. I want players to try new things. And for example, like if a player does a new move and he shoots an air ball, I'm just going to stand up, clap and say like, I really, I really be positive about it. And I think that's the big difference because most coaches would say like, ah, oh, no, it's a bad shot or, no, I want my players to feel definitely in, in practice. You need to have the freedom to, to fuck up. So we do lots of um, mini side games, a lot of one-on-one -on -one also. And I think one-on-one -on -one is, is the biggest, uh, one of the most important drills. Why? Because it's, you can try new things. And if you fuck up, it's, nobody's going to be mad at you. If you play two-on-two -two or three-on-three -three or five-on-five -five and you try a new move and you shoot an air ball, the other guys are gonna have like, gonna be like, dude, what you doing? Or they're not gonna like it. But in one on one, you can try everything you want, and it just interests for you, you know. So every practice has at least twenty minutes of one on one, and I think also very important. My my the last drill that I, that I finish every practice is, is we do ten minutes of three on three on three or four on four uh, games, and the coach cannot talk. So it's ten minutes. Uh, freelance play and the rule is I want my players to constantly communicate but the coach cannot say anything and then after the 10 minutes the, I come in and I say like what could you what, what did we go, did good what could do better stuff like that but during the 10 minutes it's it's just the players so they can be as creative as they want they can do anything as they want and for me it shows that it works you create players will become the next coaches because they can coach each other. They're constantly communicating and they solve problems on their own. They're not looking for every problem to the coach like what went wrong. They try to think for themselves. And that's uh, one of the drills I strongly believe in is you need to give your players the freedom to, yeah, to experiment. 
this is this is wonderful and I, I mean i love how you said that too about one-on-one that when you play one-on-one like you're, you're not accountable to a teammate so you can truly be yourself and that's great and I, this this may or may not be but belgium soccer made that switch a while ago i read a lot about that that they went to a lot of one-on-one at the youth level is is that the same idea that that belgium soccer saw too is that one one-on-one fosters more individual skill development but two you don't have to be accountable to anyone so you can be creative is that the idea uh yeah well i don't really have the idea from from soccer more from like experimenting but i think soccer is definitely in europe is like they're five steps ahead of basketball because they're they're they have much more resources and they have much more options soccer is, is, is huge in here so uh, what I do is I try to visit a lot of the soccer academies and try to see how they work. And I got a lot of great uh, great ideas definitely for them that I try to uh, apply in basketball. Because I think soccer, for example, is definitely also very good there in uh, creating like the random games and the decision making. And uh, yeah, they're, they're just on another level instead of basketball. Like it's So I think sometimes it's, it's good to go, go and see how other sports uh, are working and there's always something that you can try to apply in basketball no it's so true and I actually have a lot of interaction through the basketball immersion with uh, soccer coaches uh, rugby coaches lacrosse coaches uh, you know different invasion sport games that, that you know the coaches connect with me about ideas and share ideas so it's great and uh, you know the other part about one-on-one is that they they get they get decisions that you're yep. trying to develop their skills, but then they get to work on the decisions with those skills. So, so do you use constraints sometimes within the one-on-one or what types of different one-on-ones do you use to be able to foster some of that, uh, that development? Yeah. So for example, like yesterday we did, we had uh, the focus was everything from attacking the closeout. So we did like 30 minutes of every type of footwork that you can create. Uh, if the defense does this, this is the best action. If the defense, uh help you go into that second move stuff like that for 30 minutes and then we create the same situation so now we're going to add a defender and then we mix it up for example like sometimes we put the defender a little bit far away i call it uh the one second advantage so it's we we make the close out a little bit longer at the start so the offensive player get a little bit more time to read the defender and then we mix it up we bring the we make it a mini close out stuff like that or uh, today, for example, we're going to work on the flow dribble. So it's going to be, I think you call it uh, the skate dribble. Hey, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. So then, for example, it's going to be, again, 30 minutes where we work on different reads, if the different options. And I, I make it a little bit more. I say if the defense does this, this is the best option, but it's with the uh, imaginary defense for the first 30 minutes. And then we create the same situation. So now it's one-on-one where you have to make... Uh, uh, a read from the from the flow dribble. That's so, great. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. That gives us a real good perspective on what it is. And you also mentioned that, uh, you know, you spend time with your athletes watching film. And this is something I've noticed from your Instagram as well, is that, that you're big into film study and big into film study, particularly with individual players understanding other individual players and what they do can you can you discuss that a little bit about what what practically how do you use that for your athletes yeah yeah i think watching film is is one of the most important things um you can say to an athlete like 25 times like yeah your spacing is not good for example but if you can show it one time in a video like right here you should be a little bit more in the corner because a lot of the times, like even one meter can make a big difference. You, you only have to show it once to your players and they get it instead of like always talking to them. It's, they learn much quicker by, by watching tape. So a, um, we, we do it in, in two ways. We can do the, the tape, for example, for the team tactics, but we can also do the tape more individually where we see on the skills. So we will work more on the, how was your decision making? How was the uh, the details on the skill moves? So it's it's kind of like two types of uh, uh, videos that we do. The skill work videos I do privately with them. So I send them the clips uh, just on Facebook, like one on one, and then I I add my comments, and then we try to do once a week the video session of the of the team. 
No, that's tremendous. And I mean, so valuable for a player, obviously, to see not just themselves, but experts. And in some cases, novices do move. So it gives them a real good perspective of where they need to go and the task representation and everything else that goes with that. So that's, that's yeah, maybe good. even one more thing about it. Like yeah. we put also the full game on YouTube and I, I want my players to make their own uh, analyze of the game. So they watch your game. Uh, they can watch your game anytime they want. And then I want them to, to send like a, a full description on what they think that they did good on the game, what sh they should have done better, stuff like that. It's, it's also a way like you, you can use the tape also to let them think about themselves instead of like the coach always saying like what was good, what was wrong. No, that's cool. That's really cool. And I've been told to ask too about your holistic approach relative to homework traffic light system. Is that something that you still use and you yeah. still do? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so, really unique. Yeah. So the thing is, we again we want to we want to work with experts. So school is still the main priority, but we're not school experts. So we get two people who we're doing full time uh, the follow up system for the academy. So um, it works two ways. The first way is their their points get uh, how do you say it um, evaluated. So we got green, orange, and red. Green is like the perfect athlete. He can do the, the full program. Orange is like, oh, there might be a problem, it's, but it's not that bad yet. And then we try to give a solution, help him out. For example, it can be uh, extra uh, private one-on-one -on -one, uh, session to, to get the schoolwork, schoolwork back uh, 100%. And then the, the last part is the red zone is if there's really a problem, then he can, for example, he got, instead of five practices, he can only do three. And then the two other practices, he needs to go and work one-on-one -on, -one on his schoolwork. But it's not just um, saying, like, evaluating the, the scores. It's all about giving them the tools. Like, we give workshops uh, to them, like, how, you, how do you make your to-do list? Uh, how do you plan your week? How uh, should you... Uh, what is the, the most efficient way to study? Uh, we give them uh, stuff like um, biorhythm because I think the biggest uh, problem with the youth is their cell phone, the smartphone, because kids, they don't sleep anymore uh, 10 hours or eight hours a night because they're always on their phone. So we give them a, a workshop about that. We, we change um, their habits on their smartphone. Uh, we also have... Um, an app where we can see how many time, how many hours a day that they spent uh, on, on the what apps uh, on their phone. So we try to, yeah, it's more about giving them the tools to do perfectly in school in, instead of like just be the, the teacher who says like, yeah, it's good or it's not good. We want to we wanna help them to perform great in basketball and in school. But school is always the main priority because in the long run, you, you need good grades. Well, and, and that's the other part about what you're saying is that you're not just saying, hey, listen, you're in trouble or you're doing poorly. You're giving them an outlet to be able to get better in terms of the yeah. different resources you have available, whether it's classes or, as you said, the teachers that you have accessible to you to be able to help them. And, and that, it, what a great framework for all clubs. I mean, ultimately, again, we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with people that are still evolving in the world and putting them in situations where they can understand themselves better is outstanding. So you also said something about don't be a PlayStation coach. What does that mean, yeah. don't be a PlayStation coach? So I got this one from, uh, from Alex. So uh, he, he once came with the term PlayStation coach. And in, I, re I really I absolutely love the, the terminology. It's, what I mean with that is... Uh, a PlayStation coach is the coach who is on the side, like he's constantly yelling what the players need to do. So he's like, pass, we do this, you do that, shoot, attack. And he's like, he wants to have control over his players all the time. And I think that is like definitely for youth basketball, it's, it's so bad because you, there is no decision making anymore for the kids. There is no uh, creativity anymore for the kids. There is no learning anymore. There, because the coach is like telling them everything to do. So in my opinion, like the, the best coaches, they should be able to sit on the bench during a game and just relax and watch the game and maybe say small things. Like when, uh, when you do the subs, for example, or, or, or maybe one of the, uh, call, call a timeout and, and give them some orders. 
But if you're constantly yelling during the game, I think you're not doing a good job as a coach because it means like your players are not good enough to to make the decisions on their own. So you should change your 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 practices because the ultimate goal should be that the players become have the same knowledge as you. That's what we we strongly believe in is you want to create player coaches and not players who are just um uh, I, I don't know how you say it in English, but how, uh, players who are constantly looking at the coach and the coach is like the big boss and the players just need to listen. I, I don't believe in, the, in that system. Uh, well, and, and you can tell by everything you've said so far how you build that uh, and, and you, build, you build the opposite mentality for your players and for your, your coaches involved. And I couldn't agree more that guidance hinders, uh, hinders you know, play and that's really what we want we want players to play free so you know you mentioned this already and i want to circle back because you said that, that one of the big focuses in your program is is the mindset of a player and you even go to the point in terms of recruiting athletes for your program or the the athletes that you choose to be in your program that that in some cases you'll take mindset over physical build or physical attribute right that's that's what we're talking yeah, about in terms sure. of because you think long term, someone with a mindset will get better. Now, I understand you have a test for this that you do, and that uh, it was shared with yeah. Greg Popovich in Belgrade. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so it's kind of like um, you, you're gonna stretch out your arms, and you're just gonna stand like this, and you're just gonna hold it. And we do the test for like seven minutes, so you just need to stand and keep your arms up. And the only the the only thing we say is like just keep your hands up, don't let them drop. That's the only, the, uh, the only goal. But what you see is like after 10 seconds, your shoulders start to, starts to burn and everybody just wants to drop the shoulders. But if you stand for this like seven minutes or, or even longer, like it's not like your arms are going to fall off. It's not like you're going to get sore or you're going to get an injury. It's just, it's just you versus you. You know, it's like, do you find a way to bite through the being uncomfortable and just stand like this. So we were at the uh, NBA Without Borders camp and the players, the mindset was was not great. Like we had a lot of the kids were the most talented players, but they were, in my opinion, not really the hardest workers. So we wanted to do this test and like 90% just failed after one minute. And uh, we were talking about this with, uh, with Popovich and he said like, all right, I want to do the test. <laughs> so we did it again and he just stand there for seven minutes. And he, he was like, if I can do it, like, why can't you guys do it? Like, it's just a question about how bad you want it. It's, it's find a way to, to, yeah, buy through it. And th that's one of the, the drills we do almost every week with our players is, we we want them to be so mentally strong that if you're uncomfortable, it's it doesn't matter anymore. Like we buy through it, and it's an easy test for us to uh, to see what kind of mentality you have. So, for example, like what we do also with uh, it's the first test for if if players come for tryouts for our academy, it's the first thing we do, and it's all you can immediately see. Like last year, we had one kid who was like standing completely still for like seven minutes with like his, his eyes were like locked in. So he didn't even touch the ball and he was already picked. Like every <laughs> coach said, oh, we want that kid because yeah. that kid is, that kid get the right mindset. So yeah, we strongly believe in that for sure. <laughs> That's well, a... it's really cool, uh, Popovich, yeah. Yeah, so, so Popovich actually did it. Did, did he do it yeah, with he the players it. or did he do it in front of the players? Yeah, with the players. He did yeah. it in front of the players. And he was, he was just sending a message like, yeah. if I can do it, then why, why can't you guys do it? It well, was that's, cool. That's a great story and a great connection to, you know, being uncomfortable is okay, but, you know, it's, it's that grit, that perseverance, that mindset, all those things that ultimately are going to determine your success in so many ways. So, no, that's, that's, that's yeah. awesome. So, um, what is the structure for your pro players? And maybe as, as kind of a final thing, is the structure for your pro players, is it similar to what you talked about already in terms of the youth development? Yeah, actually it is. Like, I think um, I try to make – the only thing what I see with the pro players is 
I can be less creative with them because they're they're not getting the creativity with their with their team. So that's maybe the only uh, difference between the youth and the pro players is with the pro players you. I, I know they can do much more than they can show because basketball definitely in Belgium is players are, are put in the box. Like you have, you have to stand in the corner and you need to do the catch and shoot. And it's, they they very, they take away all the creativity from the players. So I need to think a little bit more inside the box. So for example, I, I, last year I had an American guy. And the coach, the coach uh, knew he was training extra with me. And he literally called me and he said, I'm never going to let them do more than one dribble in the game. So everything you do needs to be with one dribble. <laughs> so that's, that's the way a lot of the pro, pro coaches think because I think coaches in, definitely in Europe, they, they want to make it more about them, about it's my system and we're going to run the way I see it instead of like using the creativity of the players and making it more like give them options to read. I think that's a, the biggest difference also between maybe the, the States and, uh, and Europe in the, the way the kids play. Kids are much more creative, I think, in, in the States because they get, they get more uh, freedom. And in Belgium, they, they, they try to take away the freedom. And that's why I'm, I'm a lot of the times pretty limited with what I teach to the to the pro players because it, it has no point in the beginning I was like oh yeah you can do this and you can that and I come to this, see the games and then I know they can do it but they're just not they're just not getting the the freedom from the coach so it's yeah with the pros it's always a little bit more limited well and I'm glad you said that because I think too often all of us as coaches look and see what a pro trainer does with pros oh and says why are, we should be doing that we should be and anyone that's listening to this podcast is going to get a completely different picture, which is what I love is about like the, the long, slow build for a youth player is completely different than focusing on what a pro player does well so they can keep making money. Right. And yeah. that's a completely different deal. And, and uh, I, I'm so happy you made, you made those points and made those connections. Cause I, I, I don't think there's anything more valuable than people understanding that as well. So is, is there anything else you'd like to highlight about uh, what you guys do and how you do it? Uh, we're going to, we're going to direct people most immediately to your Instagram, which is mm -hmm. at J O E R I K at, at York. And uh, yep. you know, I encourage everyone to go follow and uh, you always already have a tremendous following, but uh, I think more coaches need to follow you and, uh, and learn more about what you guys do. But uh, is there, is there anything else you want to leave us with in terms of some thoughts about development? Oh, maybe one advice that I have for coaches is um, you want to you need to create the habit of of becoming a better coach and I think like the problem is always time for everyone nobody get time but if you can create a habit like if you for example like listen to a podcast when you're in the car or when you watch a, at least 10 minutes a day a YouTube video or uh, maybe read a book uh, when you're on the toilet. It, it, it doesn't matter, but you need to create some kind of habit as a coach that you can do at least 10 minutes every day in becoming, in learning new things. I think if you can do that as a coach, that in the long run, it's going to be, it's going to build up. But that's, I think the biggest problem with coaches is that we, Almost nobody wants to put in the work to becoming a better coach. Basketball is always evolving. So as a coach, you should be always evolving too. And the best coaches are not, uh, are just the best re researchers in, in a lot of the times. Like you need to pick the brain from other trainers and yeah, learn as much about the game as possible. Well, what a great note to finish on because you've done a great job sharing today. And uh, I think so many coaches will be stimulated by your thinking and hopefully help them reflect on what they do and how they do it. So thank you for taking the time. And uh, I know you and I will keep in touch as we go forward over the next uh, whole bunch of years of our basketball lives. Because you're jumping back into the gap. I went to coach. It's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. 